So I am going to do some of the research and some of the ideas that sit behind the works that are in this exhibition. I'm also going to talk a little bit about machine learning, AI, and why I think it's interesting to use in a creative practice right now. So this is a still from my terminal when you kind of like program stuff up when, you, when I was training the tulips. When you work with machine learning or AI as an artist, I feel that there are two main materials, two main things that you can do as part of your practice and kind of work with. One is the data or training set, which I'll come back to. And then the other is the algorithm that is run on that data or training set to create something, to create the model, to create the AI. The algorithms that I use and that I'm partic particularly interested in are those called GANs, or Generative Adversarial Networks. Has anyone come across GANs before? Yeah. So a GAN is a form of unsupervised machine learning invented in 2014, which basically is ma makes it ancient and kind of like the AI hype cycle at the moment. And it's considered, even in the scientific world, to be kind of notoriously unsa unstable and not that well understood. And it's this complex iterative process of two networks dancing around each other with many, many, many interdependencies. Um, and basically how it works is it's most commonly described as you have these two networks and one is an art forger and one is a detective. And you have like this training data, this information that you give it. And the art forger is trying to make an image, in, in my case, that looks like it could come from the training set, the photographs of tulips. And the detective network says, no, this is, this is fake. This is definitely fake. It's a blob. And then the art forger learns from that and gets better and then produces another one. And then the detective says, yes, no, yes, no, normally no. And then it works like that for hundreds and hundreds of cycles, epochs, training, learning from each other, learning the mistakes, learning kind of what is in this data set, learning patterns, learning all of these different things until it gets to the point where the network that is the art forger can produce an image that the detective can't tell hasn't come from the training set. And it's kind of like, and the way that it's described in the scientific paper that, that produced this kind of way of working is that it calls it the counterfeits are indistinguishable from the genuine articles, and which I think is a really nice way of putting it. And there's, it's kind of like been termed in the community that these images that come out when you put them into video forms, is an, it's commonly known as dreaming or hallucinating, which again is this really lovely, vivid way of kind of describing it. That is the technical description, but what do these networks produce? In this video, which is from a scientific experiment, these photographs, these kind of images, aren't just pulled together from parts of photographs that have been stitched together using like Photoshop or whatever, but entirely imagined or generated um, <coughs> images of what the model thinks it should be drawing or producing for each category in question using a GAN. And even though this is a scientific experiment, the images for me are incredibly beautiful. They have this meandering dreamlike quality like results that are recognizable as being real, but at the same time have these very obvious tells that they're not. If you pause it at any moment and actually look at the image, it's, you can tell so quickly that they're not, that they're definitely not real images. But it's these imperfections, these traces of process. <laughs> this is a quality that I really love and that I want to question and that I want to work with because I do feel that there is going to be a finite time where these traces still exist. If you look at how the technology industry is moving forward, um, and a lot of these algorithms that I use and that are being used creatively have been produced by kind of like large corporations, university, and are open sourced. It's very easy to kind of get this kind of these uh, like from GitHub or Archive to find the, the, the um, code to make these things work. But the way that they are kind of like driving is towards realism and advancement and all the research in, um, in computer vision is heading towards having very hyper-realistic deep fake <coughs> images and trying to minimize these mistakes. And for me, that is worrying, not only because I think that these are really interesting visually, but because these mistakes, these errors draw attention to the process 
And also, with that kind of, with that attention, what is wrong with the process? As soon as something becomes too smooth, it stops being noticeable. And when something stops being noticeable, people stop questioning or challenging it. So equally important to the algorithm are the training sets or images that are given to them as input or knowledge, and they're central to whatever the algorithm will, will give. Data sets that are needed to make training sets are extremely large. There are like thousands and thousands, sometimes millions of images and inputs, and very often proprietary. So as I mentioned, whereas the algorithms for machine learning are very often open sourced, even by large technology companies like Google, the appropriate data sets that you need to make them run are not readily available. And, a, and this is like a big problem, I think, in machine learning. And this is where like, you start to get like the arms race. Um, it's around data. It's around having the information to make these things work. There are some that are open source that are used um, as a benchmark for um, kind of computer vision research. But, and these tend to kind of like, these are the ones that I think a lot of the critique has been happening around because they're open source because you can actually see what's in them. And these, all data sets are, are compiled by, compiled using like a variety of different methodologies, but because people are always involved at some point in either the source content or in the process, they inevitably become to enshrine cultural or social attitudes, otherwise known as data set bias. And how that manifests itself is like this. And ImageNet is a very canonical database that is used as a benchmark for so much computer vision that even when you're using kind of some other algorithm, it's probably been tested against ImageNet at some point. It's a huge database. It has something like 14 million images and took years to produce. And it's just, it's everywhere in computer vision. But then because it's so large, when you actually start to kind of go through and look at what is inside each of its definitions and the kind of illustrations that it uses for each of those definitions, you start to see how narrow and conventional it is. But if you look at how it's defined a female, and then you look at the different kind of like categorizations that you can have, it's either super sexualized or you're an old hag, and that's it. And that is kind of like how this kind of like this canonical important database is kind of categorizing women. And then further, then if you look at like what someone who is attractive looks like, it's again, you know, like white, sexualized, young. And you can start to see how if something is recognizing someone in a certain way, it's because it's been told, and it, because this definition is so narrow, this is where all of these problems start to come out. But as I mentioned, when you start to use these data sets that exist, kind of like these off-the-shelf data sets, these, these, um, these kind of canonical ones, they're so large, it's virtually impossible to look through every single image in, this, in these data sets. Kate Crawford and Tre Trevor Paglin recently did a project on this. ImageNet was made in, I want to say, 2009? Yeah, it was made in 2009. And it took Kate Crawford and Trevor Paglin doing a project on just, not everything, just how people are portrayed in it for them to kind of go back and scrub and look at their definitions. Because, because it's so large, nobody's looking at this stuff. It's just sitting there kind of like being kind of like in this background with all of these definitions kind of like being problematic. And like another, another example that I quite like is Freak Monster, where you have kind of like very clearly kind of like Frankenstein things, but then you have people with tattoos. And it's again, it's this kind of like hidden thing that you can't find. It's so difficult to find where these biases are kind of like put into these systems that makes it so problematic. And this is something that I'm incredibly interested in. And it's breaking this apart and exploring it and expounding it that is um, very central to my practice. And I have tried to really think about what the data set is and how you can work with it in a, in a way that kind of can open up and offer a different alternative way of working with AI that I will come back to. Self-generated data is so important and I think can be a real political act to use it in, within these systems. 
I either generate it myself, like I've done for this project, or I will take a very, very large database, something like WikiLeaks, and read everything in it, um, and kind of really construct everything and be very conscious. And this kind of like way of working with data and way of working with data sets can be a decisive creative act. And I'm not the only one who thinks like this, because British copyright law um, also kind of treats a database as a literary work because of the skill that goes into it and because of this importance that they recognise that, you know, it's not just this thing that you pull off the internet. There is this human element to it. So that, that's just a bit of a, a preamble. How do I, how do I um, use this in the project? So it's actually quite nice doing it in this room because you don't have to, like, watch the horrible rendered one. On You can just turn around and see it, and it's all its installation glory. Um, I try to use both of these things, both the kind of idea of the algorithm and the data set in my work, not just as a tool, but also as a process, and try to really explore and unpick them and see if they can kind of start to echo any concepts in the work. Um, not, not just thinking around the ethics of it, but also to kind of like explore concepts that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So mosaic virus draws, as Yanis mentions, historical parallels between tulip mania that swept across the Netherlands and Europe in the 1630s um, to the speculation going on around cryptocurrencies. Each still of the video work is generated using um, machine learning and is controlled by the price of Bitcoin. So mosaic is the name of the virus that causes the stripes and the petal. Uh, which increased their desirability during tulip mania and helped cause speculative prices. In this piece, the stripes depend on the value of Bitcoin, changing over time to show how the market fluctuates. And I wanted to use this technology and this theme to draw together ideas around capitalism, value, and the tangible and intangible nature of speculation and collapse from this, these two different yet similar moments in history. And I'm not the first person to draw connections between tulip mania and Bitcoin. In, I think it's 2013, so a long time ago now, like the Dutch central bank kind of like saw this connection unsurprisingly. It felt like it was like a nice way of working. But when you train algorithms, like when you train models, you get some, as I described, like each time they kind of like the detective and the art forger check against each other. It kind of like you get something called a learning rate. And so it kind of like goes up and up and up and up as, as they kind of learn to get better. And then suddenly, sometimes, it, and if you plot that, it should, you should get a nice kind of like line like that. And sometimes GANs are notorious for suffering something called mode collapse, where they just stop working and their behavior kind of collapses like that. So the way that this technology behaves when it's kind of learning things echoes how the way that stock markets behave if you chart them on the graph. So again, it's kind of thinking about how you can use this technology, not just because it's there, but as a way to critically reflect on the state of markets. Even ones like cryptocurrencies, which were set up to trigger a radical break from the social systems of the past. And I question whether they've actually managed to do that. The mosaic virus gave blooms their distinctive stripes. But at the time, people didn't understand that this was the case. Nobody knew what caused tulips to have their stripes. And because they didn't know that, the stripy tulips became the most valuable ones. And um, at one point, the most expensive tulip in, in this kind of speculative bubble went for the same price as an Amsterdam townhouse. And then 18 months later, went for the price of an onion. So that's the kind of amount of money that was floating about. Um, but this mosaic virus is really nice as well because it's one of the only instances of a plant disease actually increasing the value of the plant. But it would kind of like occur and they, people wouldn't know why it, was, why it was happening because you could have a tulip that would be white one year and the next year have very beautiful red stripes in it. And they would do all sorts of things to try and replicate this kind of thing. They would take a white tulip bulb and a red tulip bulb, cut them in half, glue them together, hope that that would work. They imported 
earth from Holland and put it in the ground in England, thought that would work. They painted stripes, red stripes in the, in the dirt and hoped that would work. But there was just no idea for this thing that was essentially acting as money why it like they had no concept of kind of like what was generating the wealth in it there was there was a real lack of understanding between kind of like this bulb and what was coming what would come out of it growers kind of like they wanted it to seem strange and difficult and unobtainable because that increased its value and this lack of understanding around the thing that is generating wealth there's another nice connection between the rush towards um, blockchain technology and, and also cryptocurrencies. When it started, this is my favorite anecdote, but the Long Island Iced Tea Corporation just sold iced tea and other beverages, but it changed its name to the Long Blockchain Corporation and shares rose by 500% in pre-market trading just because they added the name blockchain to it. And I think there is this kind of like rush towards these systems because people think that they're going to make money off it. They don't really understand the system. They don't really understand how it all works, but they just know they're going to make money. And again, so there is this kind of like this similarity between this lack of understanding around the things that's causing wealth. And it's also worth noting, and this is another reason why I kind of wanted to use machine learning or AI as it is constantly called, in this project because it is in its own economic hype cycle. You can buy AI toothbrushes that will help you brush your teeth. You know, that, and it, you know, they have like, it, it really is not artificial intelligence. Like it will have like a small algorithm and maybe, but it's the way that things are being marketed. There's so much money pouring into this industry that used to be kind of like this very niche academic field. And now people are getting paid hundreds of thousands of pounds. And so I think this is, we're, in, we're seeing a speculative bubble in and of itself. So again, trying to make the material reflect some of the concepts. Another reference point for this project is very lovely 17th century Dutch still life. Um, the so-called vanitas paintings, which illustrate that beauty and treasure are only fleeting, which makes it a nice, a nice parallel when you start thinking about the stock market. And I wanted to take this tradition and rework it. Um, and what makes it nice is that in this painting, the flowers in it couldn't all exist at the same time because they're from spring and summer and autumn and maybe winter. And so the painter wasn't painting it from a bunch of flowers that was in front of them. They were painting it from the knowledge of all the flowers that they'd seen, all of the sketches that they'd seen, putting it together to make something that is impossible. Like this can exist. This is like an amalgamation of the things that the painter knew. And this is a really nicely echoes how the Gans construct images. Because as I said before, they're not just replicating something that they've seen, but they're drawing from all of the different aspects of the things that they've seen to create something new. So there's like, again, a nice parallel there, I think. But so then I decided I wanted to make it in this tradition. I wanted to have tulips against a black background. You can't just go to Google and say, give me 10,000 photographs of tulips against a black background. And I wouldn't want to do that anyway for all of the reasons that I talked about around kind of like the problems that you get when you take other people's images. I very much wanted to make my own data set. So I took 10,000 photographs of tulips. Um, and luckily I was working in the Netherlands, so it was actually affordable, although I still spent so much money. Um, and Doing this process, it makes you, it like, it forces you to examine each image and inverts the usual way of making this type of data set. Normally, these types of data sets are taken using images from the internet, a lot of the time from like Flickr or somewhere like that. And then Mechanical Turks will label them really quickly from kind of like, they'll be given kind of options and they'll, they'll click it and they have like two seconds to decide. And it's this kind of like, there are all sorts of issues around invisible labor, around power relations, around kind of like making it that way. And there is a huge difference between pulling down 
20,000 images and labeling them in that way, or taking those 20,000 photographs yourself. When you do the latter, you notice, and in the course of like making this, I was just seeing tulips everywhere, and I was seeing stripes everywhere. Um, and you kind of like, and the process of making this becomes like craft, repetitive, time consuming, but necessary in order to produce something, something beautiful. And there is skill to it. And I think this is one of the other things, because I think everyone talks about the algorithms and everyone kind of like, and algorithms also are authored. Um, they're in textbooks. You can search by someone's name and you can find what they've done. It isn't the same for databases. They, especially like things like ImageNet, the Mechanical Turks who made that, their names are nowhere near it. Um, and there is, there is a real skill to making these things because if you make it too big, which um, if there are too many images, the results for me become too good and the quirks and oddities that make it really interesting to work with start to disappear. And if you make it too small, um, the model won't have enough information and it, will become, and it won't be able to produce anything. It will just crash or it will just produce the same thing over and over and over again. And when I was making this piece, it kind of became this kind of like iterative process because I would make the data set, I'd train it, I'd see what it would produce and then I'd, be like, I'd try to kind of like work with the output to try and then work out what new tulips I needed to buy and then kind of like it would go again and again and again. Because like, because as I said, these systems, GANs, aren't that well understood. And one of the things that they don't understand is that for some reason, it really loves hypersaturated colors. So the first time that I made it, because I'm so interested in like bias and, and prejudice and all of these things, I was like, I will make a very structured data set with kind of 20% white, 20% pink, 20% yellow, and an and an and. And then I ran it and it just produced 80% red tulips. And so even when you try to kind of be careful and considered, there are still things kind of beyond your control that you can't work with. So that's, and so the data set kind of like by working with kind of input that I would put into the data set, I was able to control a little bit more the output that I got out. Normally when you kind of get these, these GANs to dream or hallucinate, it just, you, you can't, it doesn't know anything. It, you've just given it a load of stuff and it's just trying to like make things. But in order to control it, you need to give it a label. So that first example where it was morphing, that I showed where it was morphing between categories, that's because it was shown, I don't know, lots of pictures of penguins and then lots of pictures of tigers with the label penguin and tiger. And then it was able to understand what is what and then morph between them. If you just gave it loads of images, it would just produce random things and not, you wouldn't be able to tell it, I want pictures of tigers. So the other thing that I had to do for my project, because I wanted to be able to control what was coming out of the AI with the price of Bitcoin, I had to categorize every single photograph by hand, what color it was, what type of tulip it was, how striped it was, whether it was a bud or dying, whether it had a leaf on it. And this is an insane amount of work. And this work is usually hidden. You don't see this when you kind of are using kind of like image classifiers. You don't see this when you're kind of like on your iPhone and it's labeling everyone's faces that you know. But I really wanted to make this visible as part of the project. And I chose to make it a separate work and installation, part of which is here. Um, the entire thing is 50 square meters. Um, and I chose to kind of um, draw attention to this act of categorization by including some of it on the photo and also to the human element by handwriting each of the labels. Because I'm re really, really interested in bringing the human out of the technological. Because for me, a lot of digital art can sometimes be a bit a bit shiny and neuter the messiness of the world. And I'm interested in the opposite, how you can use this medium to maintain and accentuate humanness and the sense of the human behind it. And one of the kind of other things that kind of like came, 
came out, particularly through um, trying to classify colour, which just ended up being really, really, really difficult. And this is something that sits in the history of scientific classification. So Carl Linnaeus, who was basically the first person to try and classify plants and group them together, openly opposed including colour as, as a label because he thought that it would just be this, it would be too confusing and that his system set out to eradicate the idea of colours. And you start to realise that this kind of idea of trying to define perceptions and sensations and separate things out is this very laboured process that sits right back into the, the history of science and that even when you try to be the most scientific observer of something, it's this really difficult triangulation between sensation, material form and translation. And it isn't always a correct thing. So if you look at some of the labels, you'll, st you'll probably disagree about how I've categorised it. And even I disagreed with myself, and sometimes I will cross things out. Because it's really hard to put something into a binary category, even as something as simple as a flower. Is it white or is it pale pink? Is it red or is it orange? And if it's difficult for something simple like a single type of flower, you then have to think of the consequences of trying to do this for something complex, um, like, like gender or identity. And the reason why I think that I wanted to make it into an installation rather than just keep it on a hard drive, which is where it lived, because it needed to be digital in order to process it, is that it's so easy to forget in a digital age that information is physical and that the things that you see on a screen, like the tulips there, once started out in the real world. Like buying thousands of tulips and transporting thousands of tulips and stripping all of the leaves, that was very physical work. And as a, as a new media artist, I was not expecting that. And I think when you take these digital things or like by placing things back into the real world, people can start to comprehend aspects of the data that they didn't before. Like you will have a very different reaction to kind of seeing those photographs in a space with the writing than if, I, if you just scrolled through a thousand photographs on a screen. You can kind of start to understand things around labor, you can start to understand things about scale, the amount that is needed for these things. Um, and just to kind of like, finish, I suppose, is that this act of categorization, this act of labeling was such a core part of the project. But despite all of this work that I put into it, and it was literally about four months worth of work, it is a mistake to think that I have control. It's impossible for me to predict what will come out of my model. I can guess, but I can never know. And this is what makes it such a for me, a wonderful thing to work with, that you have to have these two very opposing states of mind to work with it. Be the type of person who will willingly sit there categorizing color for four months or for two months and be very, very attentive. And then be also the type of person who can totally succeed control over the output to something else. It's, it's really exciting, but also incredibly stressful. Um, and this whole project, as it comes together in this room, in this space, I found became about abstraction, which is hence the title of the, the exhibition. The flowers in the, 18th, in the 17th century became totally abstracted from nature to become money. The visualization that kind of floats and kind of plays behind you is now kind of like a moving image piece that is abstracted from the cryptocurrency. And then the beautiful photographs that are on the wall using computer vision became totally abstracted and no longer were kind of like these kind of images of flowers, but just a series of, of numbers and an array. And this kind of working through the material, through the kind of like the subject matter, using machine learning, it allowed me to kind of tie together the concept and the material and think through ideas that I don't think I would have been able to do any other way. Thank you. <laughs>